One of the highlights of this program each year is what we call the flag arbor that our veterans and their families just walked through. We want to thank the middle school band under the direction of Mr. Jonathan Hinton for playing Legacy of Heroes and the Thunder for the Veterans Processional and Assembly. on some street or who's had weapons drained. The point is, give thanks for their service. Good morning. My name is John Stevens. I'm the head of the middle school. For those of you who don't know, the agenda, organization, and execution of our Veterans Day event is part of our seventh grade curriculum. Our seventh grade students strategize, design, and implement the day's events. Every year is different. Each year I have had the pleasure of welcoming you and making a few comments on the importance of the day. I went back and read my comments from previous years and noticed a common theme. The recurrent theme has been what this day, what your sacrifices, what your presence, and what your stories do for our students today. Over the years, you have been a tangible example to our students of the importance of honor, courage, integrity, responsibility, personal sacrifice, standing for your principles, and a number of other traits we hope to instill in our students. These are important concepts and lessons. But what dawned on me was the recurrent theme of what you do for us. And, and though important, it seemed a bit backwards. So I want this to be different. I want it to be about what we can do for you. We are limited, and our efforts pale in comparison to what you have done and do for us. But I want us to give what we can back to you. It isn't much, but on behalf of myself, the faculty at Fort Worth Country Day, our students in our community, we want to offer our deepest, most heartfelt thanks for what you have done for us. Veterans, thank you for your service for our country. Thank you for the time you spent away from your loved ones to keep us safe and uphold our values. Thank you for your patriotism. I want to thank those who gave their lives and those who risked their lives. Thank you for your selflessness. Thank you for your humility. Thank you for life, liberty, and the American way. Freedom is not free. Thank you for our freedom. Thank you for the greatest generation and the traits that are inherent in the military which define that generation. Thank you for being our heroes. Finally, thank you for your example. It is the example of all we want to instill in our students. Students, faculty, and staff, Please rise and help me give back to these great Americans through an expression of our appreciation for all their Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Would Mr. Eric Lombardi, head of school, please come to the stage to welcome the veterans on behalf of Fort Worth Country Day? I'm the new guy, for those of you who are uh, veterans and wouldn't know that. Everybody else has heard that plenty of times. So I get to do something Mr. Stevens has done previously, which is thank the seventh graders, actually, for this particular event. My thanks are, first of all, of course, to you all as veterans who are visiting us today, but personally, as the relative of a number of veterans who a day like today honors, my thanks are to you all, class of 2021, and your teachers and Mr. Stevens for making Veterans Day at Fort Worth Country Day such a particularly special event that you as middle schoolers have done so much to create this wonderful ceremony says a great deal about you, about your sense of responsibility to recognize the resilience of and sacrifices made by not only the veterans in attendance today, but also all of their federal, fellow veterans over the history of our country. Thank you, seventh grade, for today. On a completely personal note, I'm incredibly grateful that I feel a day like today allows me 
even forces me to stop and honor family members. My paternal grandfather, Cornelius Lombardi, was an ambulance driver for the French Red Cross before the U.S. was involved in World War I. He returned to serve in the Rainbow Division field artillery, was gassed in the trenches, and earned a Silver Star and Purple Heart. He would have celebrated what was known as Armistice Day, the very first go-around in 1918. My maternal grandfather, Irving Carter, was asked to move his family of four kids, including my mom, who's here today, from Connecticut to California to serve his Army Air Corps duties for the duration of World War II. My uncles, Leonard and Neil Lombardi, were both Marines in World War II, one a survivor after a year in the hospital of a munitions supply explosion, the other serving on the USS St. Louis. And my father, Richard Lombardi, also here today, was a naval officer in the waters off of Japan, Taiwan, and China from 1955 to 1957. What a gift for me personally to get to stop and think and remember what veterans in my own family have done for us as a country and for me as a person. So thank you seventh graders for giving us all the chance not only to think about the veterans in our own families today, but also to thank the veterans we get to meet today. Because you put this event together, the opportunity is ours. Thanks most of all, though, to you veterans who have honored us with your presence. May it be a wonderful Veterans Day for all. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. As Emma said, I'm her grandfather, also the grandfather of her sister, Chloe, who's in the upper school. I'd like to welcome all the veterans here today on behalf of the middle school. Uh, I myself served during the Vietnam era uh, in the United States Air Force and, and remember that service very proudly and, and, and wouldn't, wouldn't take anything in the world for that service. One thing I'd like to see here is the branches of service represented. So as I call out the branch of service, please stand up and then be seated after everyone stands for that branch. Uh, the United States Army. Thank you. The United States Navy and Marine Corps. United States Air Force. And do we have anyone here from the Coast Guard? Again, welcome and thank you very much for your attendance and thank the middle school very much for their design and implementation of this program. Thank you.
ask one of our classmates, Rogan Crumlin, to come to the stage to introduce his grandma. <coughs> service in the military has changed. In 1962, when I turned 18 years old, I had to sign up for the selective service. Basically, it was the draft for the military. At that time, every male was required to serve in the military after they turned 18, unless for medical reasons they were exempt from service. Thus, when you turned 18 years old and completed high school, or dropped out of high school and did not go to college, you were drafted in the military. You could be deferred from the military while you were attending college. However, if you dropped out of college or if you went to graduate, and, or when you graduated from college, you would be drafted in the military. In December 1969, the law was changed to allow the first selective service lottery draft. The draft was based on the date of your birth and when your birth date was drawn in the lottery. If your birth date was one of the earlier dates drawn in the lottery, you were drafted into the military. And if your birth date was one of the last ones drawn in the lottery, you were not drafted. Thus, every male was no longer required to serve in the military. It depended on your birth date when your birthday was drawn in the lottery process on whether you served in the military. In June 1973, the law allowing the lottery draft expired and the military went to the current all-volunteer military. In the all-volunteer military, no one is required by law to serve in the military. Now, the individuals serving in the military are individuals that serve in the military because they want to and they have agreed to. There are many reasons that people join the military. Probably the primary reason that an individual serves in the military is a strong love of country, a patriotic feeling for the United States combined with a strong feeling of need to serve. There are also other reasons that are combined with the patriotic reasons that individuals serve in the military. Educational opportunities, such as attending one of the military academies, these academies provide good education and a clear opportunity. Other individuals that do not go to the military academies still see the military as a career. There is financial assistance available when attending school and educational opportunities while in the military service. The GI Bill provides for financial assistance for education after leaving the services. Some individuals join the military to learn a skill or a trade that can be used after leaving the military. Some people want the structure and the discipline that the military service provides. Other individuals who do not feel they're ready to go to college or who have dropped out of college go into the military to help them decide what to do with their life. In addition, there are other benefits in serving in the military. Individuals learn to become goal-oriented and task-oriented. They learn and accept authority. They learn the importance of working with others to complete tasks. They become self-motivated. 
Many employers find that individuals that have served in the military make very good employees. While the military service may not be for everyone, there are certain definite benefits and reasons why some people serve in the military. Let's now turn our attention to Ms. Erin Yipia as she leads the middle school choir in singing Let Freedom Ring. Things that 
Charlie and his wife liked to do was to attend the movies at the Rialto Theater. For one thing, it was the only place in town that was air conditioned, so it provided a respite from the South Texas heat. For another, they got to watch the newsreels as well as get the latest movies. And in those newsreels, those days, they saw turmoil that occurred all over Europe as Hitler began his march across the European continent and all over Asia as Japan did as well. It never occurred to them that those events in those foreign lands would have an impact on their life until the day the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And Charlie knew that he was going to have to go and help defend his country, defend the type of life that he and his young wife had settled on and found to be so pleasant. Before he could do that, though, he had to dispose of his business because by this time, Charlie had become self-employed. He had a panel truck. He sold uh, candy, chips, cigarettes, and that sort of thing to a variety of small neighborhood grocery stores. So he, he disposed of his business quite readily, but he also wanted to hang around because his young wife was pregnant. And he wanted to see his baby before he left for the war because he didn't know for sure whether he would ever have that opportunity again. But finally, after several months, Charlie went off to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio to boot camp. And it was the first time, really, he'd been out of his South Texas community. Six months later, he found himself on a troop ship crossing the Atlantic Ocean, an area that he certainly had never imagined that he would cross. Charlie arrived in England and spent six intense weeks practicing with his comrades for the invasion of France. On May 31st, the Allies began to load 2,727 ships in eight English ports with the equipment and the supplies and the material that it was going to take to invade continental Europe. Charlie went on board a troop ship on June the 3rd, expected to depart shortly thereafter for an invasion on June the 4th. The weather was terrible. The rain was falling in torrential downfall. The wind was howling, the surf was high, and General Eisenhower recognized that his boats that were going to have to uh, come up, uh, on shore in Normandy would never be able to get through the surf. And so consequently, he postponed it. Charlie and 200 of his comrades sat confined in the hull of that ship. And those of us that have ever been in the military know that hurry up and wait is a very common occurrence in the military. For 48 hours they sat there smoking their lucky strikes and cannon cigarettes, uh, playing cards, writing letters home, and thinking about what they were faced in the near future. And finally, late in the day on the 5th, the convoy began to steam out of the English ports on its way to Normandy. They anchored at 2.15 in the morning, 11 miles off the shore of Normandy in the heavy swells of the English Channel. Those that were not seasick for the passage certainly got seasick as they sat there at anchor. They were 11 miles out in order to be able to be outside the range of the shore batteries of the German guns. Finally, at dawn, wave after wave of planes began to roar overhead. The naval battleships began their bombardment of the German emplacements. The, the cacophony of sound, even at 11 miles out, was overwhelming. And they could see the noise, hear the noise, and clearly see the gun flashes as they were uh, looking toward the shore. They sat, they sat bobbing in those swells for 12 hours, imagining the horror that awaited them on the beach. From their vantage point, they had witnessed explosions that destroyed landing craft, seen planes that crashed, and watched boats ferrying loads of casualties to hospital ships that were anchored nearby. The inability to clearly see what was happening on the beach exacerbated their anxiety. With the second tide of the day, the groups of 36, Charlie's unit, began offloading to smaller Higgins boats for the two-hour ride to the shore. The Higgins boats had a lot of similarity to a bathtub. It was open at the top to the ocean spray and the cold rain, and the troops were immediately wet and soaked and uncomfortable. The keel of that boat is mostly flat, and the boat wallowed from side to side. And those that previously had not been seasick certainly got so now. The bilge pumps could not keep up with the water coming in from the six-foot breaking waves. The boat was awash to their boot tops in seawater and the vomited remains 
of the scrambled egg and spam breakfast that they had had, which would prove to be their last hot meal for a very long time. Charlie waded ashore from the front ramp of the Higgins boat at about 4.30 in the afternoon. He was cold, wet, exhausted, sick, and terrified. The carnage was everywhere. Vehicles and landing craft burned freely, bodies washed to and fro in the surge, equipment lay scattered in disorderly soaked piles, wounded were placed in groups seeking aid, and scores of dead were piled up against the beach wall. But the big German guns and machine guns that had been silenced by the early waves of infantry and only small arm fire still threatened the beachhead. Moving quickly along the engineer's path through the minefield, Charlie's unit moved inland about a kilometer. They set up a perimeter, dug foxholes, and tried to get some sleep. And you can just imagine how much sleep they got. Their company had gotten this far without a casualty, but there were 2,000 American boys that were killed and injured on Omaha Beach that day. And there were another 2,900 casualties on the other four invasion beaches. The next morning, the company commander told Charlie and his, his comrades that their objective for that day would be to reach the town of St. Lo. St. Lo was about 10 miles away. It's about the distance between where we sit here and downtown Benbrook. He told them that the Air Corps had been bombing the town for days and that by the time they arrived there, there would be no one left and it would be a cakewalk. The distance uh, would prove to be much more challenging than he let them believe. Normandy is farming company, country, and it has been for centuries. The farms are divided not like fences like we have here in Texas, but by hedgerows, which are high berms of dirt covered with brambles and branches and vines and thick and penetrable stuff that grows there. This kept the pastures free of marauding cattle or other things that might get into their crops. At the end of each pasture was a gap in the hedgerow, and these gaps were where they would bring in their cattle for grazing or where they would bring in their farming equipment. If the soldiers in Charlie's company walked down the lane between the hedgerows, they were picked off one by one by the German snipers in the hedgerows. If they entered the gaps in the fields, machine gunners had sighted in on those gaps knowing that there was an easy passageway. And even novice gunners were able to slaughter the Allied soldiers mercilessly. It took only a small number of enemy to hold a field and tie up great numbers of the Allies. The tank and heavy equipment advantage that the U.S. had proved to be no help at all in this hedgerow battle. It took infantry, slogging through each hedgerow, eliminating the enemy one gun at a time. The road to St. Lo was going to prove very difficult. In fact, in the first 17 days of fighting in the hedgerows, 12 U.S. divisions suffered 40,000 casualties while advancing only seven miles. Charlie fought toward St. Lo for 43 days. That is 43 days wearing the same clothes that he wore when he waded ashore on Omaha Beach on June 6th. That's 43 days sleeping in muddy foxholes, 43 days without a bath, 43 days of cold sea rations, 43 days of terror, watching your comrades die and wondering if you're going to be next. Charlie waded ashore on June 6th wearing a private strike. When St. Lo fell 43 days later, he was Staff Sergeant Chevron's. It was promotion by attrition. The leaders were the first targets for the enemy. After the fall of St. Lo, Charlie's unit was pulled back behind the lines for a week of sleeping on real cots, hot food, baths, new clothes, and lots and lots of sleep. When they went forward again, they began to fight anew in the hedgerows north and east of St. Lo, as the Allies pushed toward Paris. On July the 30th, Charlie was leading a, a squad scouting around the edge of the perimeter of a field. And over the top of a hedgerow came a German hand grenade. We called them from potato mashers because that's what they looked like. Charlie saw it when it hit him in the chest and fell to the ground. He yelled at his men to take cover and he threw himself to the side just as the hand grenade went off. And Charlie was peppered with shrapnel from the lungs and the left leg. 
His young wife got a telegram informing her that Charlie had been wounded in action. Her worry level, which had already been high, spiked with the news of his injury. She knew no details of the extent of his injury and had no way to contact him except by the slow method of mail. She feared for his life. She feared for their future. She feared for the future of her two-year-old child. She feared for Charlie's three brothers. She feared for her four brothers, all of whom were fighting either in the Pacific or the European theater. Charlie was evacuated to England where he remained hospitalized for four months. He returned to the States and continued his recuperation while training in replacement infantry troops at Camp Fannin near Tyler. After the fall of Germany and the defeat of Jan Japan, Charlie was discharged with a mustering out pay of $185.79. He returned to South Texas to his family and began to pick up the pieces of his former life. But he would spend the rest of his life with only one lung and could never get through airport screening devices without the German steel that was still buried in his body setting off the alarms. Charlie never spoke of his time in the Army. The details of this story have come from others. He was a modest man who believed in hard work and personal responsibility. He never sought any favor for his time in the war or sacrifices he made for it. He saw it merely as his responsibility and his obligation. To my knowledge, Charlie's name only appeared in the newspaper three times. First, when he joined the Army. Second, when he was wounded. And third, when his obituary was published just shortly before his 80th birthday. I told you at the beginning of this talk that Veterans Day is special to me. It is the most personal of holidays. It is not just an amorphous day inviting us to barbecue with our friends in the backyard or a respite from our daily mail. Unlike holidays like President's Day or Thanksgiving or Labor Day or even the Fourth of July, we know the people we honor on Veterans Day. For the Charlies of the world are our fathers our brothers, our children, our friends, our mothers, our sisters, our grandparents. We know what they've done for us. We express on this day our appreciation for the sacrifices they have made and their willingness to go beyond their own self-interest. And by the way, today, November the 11th, is not only Veterans Day, but it's also Charlie's birthday. Thank you very much. To all of these veterans who have so greatly served in order to protect the lives of you, your family, friends, and all.